Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our October 5th work session. Up first today, we have a proclamation and presentation about Fire Prevention Month. So, Chief, if you could join me up here. The whole crew is coming. <laughs> guys trying to hide in the back. We see you. <laughs> so we do have a proclamation for Fire Prevention Month. The 2021 Fire Prevention Week theme, Learn the Sounds of Fire Safety. This theme focuses on recognizing the different sounds smoke and carbon monoxide alarms make and what to do when an alarm sounds. So I'm gonna let you take it here from here to talk about fire prevention. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, October, and specifically the first week of October is an important month for fire departments everywhere. Uh, for those that know a little bit of history, it was October of 1871 when reportedly Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over a lantern in the great city of Chicago. That city burned to destruction over a period of three days, resulting in 100 deaths. What most people do not know is on the same day in a little known town called Peshtigo, Wisconsin, 1,000 people died in a very similar event. So uh, ever since that time, that fire began the influence of codes, standards, fire prevention, community risk reduction, all the things that we practice today. Uh, I'm gonna say two things and then hand the uh, mic off to uh, Dale Fishhack, our fire marshal. This year's theme is the mayor shared is know the sounds of fire prevention. Your first line of defense against fires, particularly in your homes, the smoke detector, particularly when you're sleeping. That's the most dangerous time for fire deaths. 78% uh, of all fire deaths occur in single and two family dwellings. Most people don't realize that. Your best line of defense against fire is a sprinkler head. It's a firefighter that's on duty 24 by seven, uh, activates when the fire grows to the point that uh, it needs extinguishment. So uh, we are in support of both of these programs very strongly, encourage all our viewers to uh, make sure they have working smoke detectors and if they have the opportunity to install sprinklers in their homes. I'll turn it over to Dale. Thank you, Chief. So echoing on the uh, learn the sound theme, we wanna encourage everybody to know that when the alarm sounds, you need to evacuate immediately. You wanna use your fire escape plan, get to a safe place outside and a meeting place. Whether it's the smoke detector activating or the carbon monoxide detector activating, both are an emergency and you need to go out and then reach out to 911 and have units respond to help you. In the Hagerstown Fire Department, we have a program where we will install smoke detectors for you if you need them or put batteries in. Last year, we touched 153 homes by doing that. This year, we've done just a little bit over 50 homes to date. So if you need a smoke detector or you need a battery for your smoke detector, please contact us and one of the on-duty firefighters will come out in the city of Hagerstown and install that for you. It's free of charge. And you can do that by calling any, any of the fire departments in the city of Hagerstown or the main administrative office. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Mayor and Council, thank you again. Thank you. I want to get a picture. Good picture. Stretch good back. Stand up tight. Hey, smile. Good <laughs> There's one picture of Tierra, a group picture, and she's like this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, up next we have a high impact performance award presentation. So, first, I'm going to read all about why this person is receiving the HIP award, and then we will bring him up. So, back in early September, George Paris came to Earth, uh, Central Lot to perform some paperwork between inspections. 
While in the lot in his city vehicle, a person came up to him on the phone saying they needed help. English was not the first person's first language, so communication was limited. George was handed the phone, and on the line was 911 dispatch. The dispatcher let George know that the person had called because another individual was dying. George did not know where this occurred and was given directions to an alley behind Tussing Warehouse. George saw a person lying unconscious in the alley and looking gray. Dispatcher told him if he didn't start administering CPR immediately, the person could die. He did not hesitate and started chest compressions. George is certified in CPR. Another person saw what was going on and was providing breaths. The dispatcher guided them through the CPR until they could hear sirens and they continued working until HFD and HPD arrived on scene to take over. You could see the color starting to come back in the individual during this time while he was administering CPR. The individual needed assistance because he had overdosed HFD administered Narcan. So we do have the HIP award for George. Uh, George, on behalf of all of us who have lost someone to overdose, thank you very, very, very much. Your actions are much appreciated. So if you could come forward. Thank you, George. Thank you. All right. Up next, we have the Community Coalition Legislative Priorities. We have Paul Fry, the President of the Washington County <coughs> Chamber of Commerce, and Jim Kirchival, the Executive Director of the Greater Hagerstown Committee. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yep. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, Scott. Good afternoon, everybody. Glad to be here in front of you. And. I was just looking at my notes. This is the 17th year for the coalition. We've had some great wins over the years working together, and I think none as great as recently, uh, this past session, getting funding for our downtown multi-use uh, facility and baseball stadiums. We're excited about that. Uh, we are going to just, uh, in front of you, you have our uh, agenda for the coming year. Uh, some of it has been green-lighted by our team, our coalition members. Some is in are in yellow to be decided, and some we said we're going to wait on. So Jim's going to briefly go through uh, this year's agenda, um, and also we're planning for September, or excuse me, January 28th, I believe, January 26th, for our day in Annapolis, and we are planning as if we're going to hold our um, reception there as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and Jim, if you'll look at our agenda with us, and we'll see what questions you might have. Okay, uh, you all should have uh, received the handout. We just finished that from our meeting last uh, week, our last meeting we have. I do want to thank the mayor and Scott and some others who have attended the coalition um, from the city to help us with uh, some guidance and direction as we move forward. Um, the first two items, and if anybody has any questions, just please stop me any time here. Um, otherwise, I'm going to go through some of these quickly because we they've been on our list for a while. Uh, the first two items, transportation related, are of course I-81. The widening of that, phase two, we're continuing to try to push and advocate for that project, uh, as well as I-70-65 interchange improvements out around Sharpsburg Pike. There's a lot of development going out there, and we're looking to try to get that interchange improved to handle the volume of traffic that is out there now and is predicted here for the future. So those are the two transportation items. Both have been on the, the coalition's agenda for multiple years. Um, economic development. Um, the, last year, Senator Edwards uh, some, and uh, Task Force were working on the economic future of Western Maryland. Uh, they put in a request for $20 million a year for five years. This money would go into a fund that would be handled by a task force or a work group. Uh, Paul Fry is one of the uh, representatives on that task force right now, as well as Councilwoman uh, McIntyre. Um, they have a list of a variety of different uh, agenda items they'd like to, or items they'd like to focus that money on. If they get that money, then that money would be allocated on a grant basis, a competitive grant basis each year, each county getting a portion of that funding. 
uh, that would likely require some sort of match involved. Um, they're going to be putting in the same legislation again this year. This is also Senator Edwards last year after multiple decades of, of service at the state level. There is some optimism that it will be looked upon you know, fondly by the state based on Senator Edwards' many years of, of public service and that some money will go into that account and uh, we might have some things to work with there. Uh, that group asked for the coalition support last year. Um, that bill came in, uh, did, didn't get out of committee, didn't get voted on, supported, but um, it was well received by a variety of different people of our partner counties to the west. Um, education items, we didn't have anything specific this year. Dr. Clobber over at HCC, uh, you know, has most of their items accounted for. Um, you will see here a little bit later on, there's a, a request from the library that's education related. Um, in health and public safety, uh, Medicaid reimbursement was an item that's been on our agenda for two years. Mm -hmm. This involves trying to give our EMS services a uptick in, in uh, reimbursement for, for, doing, um, for doing trips uh, to the hospital. Um, Senator Gallion was one of the senators who put this in um, uh, from another county. Uh, that legislation did not pass the last couple years. He's going to resubmit it again this year and hoping for some support. Uh, senator Quarterman, our senator, is also going to put in a companion bill that has to do with allowing uh, the EMS to triage patients to other uh, locations if, if uh, it merits that. For example, they could go to an addiction center if it, it merits that. They go to a mental health or behavioral health center uh, or urgent care center instead of taking everybody to the ER. That may help pull some uh, uh, the pressure off our emergency rooms and some of the wait time that's there. So. Um, our lobbyist is going to be working on that item as well. That's been around. We haven't had a lot of success with that yet, but we're going to still try to move that forward. Uh, Boonesboro is a new partner to the coalition this year. They, uh, their council just joined in September. They have some uh, significant water reservoir improvements that are needed. They have a water reservoir that's currently leaking a lot, and they're going to be looking for some funding to help raise approximately $4 million uh, to help um, uh, upgrade that infrastructure. It may take a few years. Of asked from a variety of different uh, pots of money. Uh, they're working with some of the federal and state uh, members on that. Um, the National Park Service Headquarters and Visitor Center, that project has been uh, mostly completed for the office part and the headquarters part, but there is still some uh, fitting, uh, uh, fitting out that's needed for the visitor center. The town of Williamsport is also a partner member is asking to try to get some gap funding there to help finish that project. Um, the city brought up the indoor turf facility that you all will be looking at and talking about this month. I know there's more details to be worked out there, but we put in a placeholder for that if there's a capital request to help make that project a reality. Um, that's all the green lighted items so far for the agenda, and I will go to the yellow items here in a second. Also approved is the watch list uh, that we have every year. Uh, this, of course, is items that our lobbyist keeps track of, not necessarily a specific agenda item, but just something they want to look over. Uh, we have some of the same ones as we've had in the past, gaming, making sure that revenue is protected, shifting liabilities from state government to local governments, USMH operations. Uh, one of the new items this year is the Library Association uh, had legislation that uh, gave them an increase in per capita funding each year for several years. That older bill expired last year, so they're coming back this term asking for some new legislation to increase that each year for the next several years. So they've asked us to keep an eye on that and offer our support. Uh, also, last uh, session, uh, there was some, a variety of different police reform legislation items and bills that were passed. Uh, they believe there may be some tweaking of those bills uh, here this session, so our lobbyist is going to keep track of that as well and let us know if there's any impacts to our county. Highway user revenue is something Rodney's always uh, worked hard for, try to get our highway user revenue uh, restored <laughs> at the city level. We'll keep looking at that. Um, also, uh, enterprise zone legislation. There was a task force last summer that is starting to look at the enterprise zone tax incentive. There may, uh, there's some desire to change that or alter that. That has been a successful incentive, I know, for Jill Thompson here at the city and some of their projects, as well as Susan over at the county. Uh, we've asked our lobbyists to keep an eye on any legislation that may try to diminish that incentive, uh, as that's been a good, uh, pro or good item to have for our county as we attract new companies and investment into our area. 
Uh, Route 11 bridge is a Williamsport item. That bridge is sinking. It's going to need some replacement here over time. Uh, they want us to keep track of that. And of course, then uh, K through 12 funding uh, in education is another item we'll always try to look at. We also try to include some informational sheets to help build the brand of Washington County uh, in Annapolis. That'll include some items uh, from the city, the county, Williamsport, Boone's Bar, some of the good things going on in those areas, updates on USMH, the Dolman Museum, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, an update on some of the other projects going on in the Jonathan Street community, such as the improvements to Wheaton Park, the Loutlaw Cabin, the American Hall, those sort of things. Um, the next page uh, has to do with yellow items. These aren't off the list yet. They just still need some work. We try to make sure we have specific ask and everything identified before it gets green lighted. Uh, we need a little more time on some of these topics and there's still some debate on, on whether they're going to be topics for this session or we need to hold them off for next session. Uh, the first item was a new item that uh, the city brought in last month that has to do with online sales of cottage foods. Uh, cottage foods are, are non-hazardous uh, food projects sold at farmers markets or public events. Um, we are want to look at the legislation and see if we can expand uh, the ability to do online sales of those products. Uh, that is done in some other area, uh, states around us, such as North Carolina, PA, or Ohio, and Delaware. Um, our lobbyist actually has a good connection with a state staffer on the health committee, so he's going to check in on this issue and look into it as well. Uh, Scott's going to get back to us on um, uh, some of the details and what that request might look like. Uh, community vital revitalization issues, again, another city item had to do with blighted properties and land banking acquisition. Um, there, I know the city is looking at uh, different legislation, also working with uh, some uh, uh, staff with Baltimore City Attorney's Office on possible collaboration to try to look at ways to handle some of the blighted properties that uh, remain vacant but are owner-occupied. Um, a new item that I think is coming before the council later this month that they ask us to again to just put a placeholder in in case it's a request for this year that may also wait till 2023, but is a sculpture for Clara Barton Memorial that would go along the cultural trail or that's what uh, um, it's uh, planned for so far. I know that's still again a brand new item and needs some discussion and work and they're coming to the council to talk to that. Um, also from the city, uh, they were looking at some regulatory issues involving um, police retention and attraction uh, as uh, Hagerstown or the county are looking to hire uh, new police officers. They want the ability to hire officers that already have been working somewhere else that have gone through their local academies and perhaps a limit that they'd have to go to the academies up here. That has been a, a hurdle in recruitment and uh, we're looking to try to see if there's some changes we could do there. Um, next page talks about a new visitor's welcome center along I-81. I-81 is the only major interstate without a visitor center uh, for Maryland. Uh, the CVB is interested in doing the operations for this, which is something a little different as typically the state has to pay for those operations. The CVB would just look for help to get the uh, capital cost to get that built somewhere along I-81. Um, right now, they're debating if the request is for this year or last year and whether to go through state, uh, seeking state funds or whether to go after some count, uh, federal funds that have uh, targets for visitor center. Um, the South County and Roxbury Rail Trail is an item that was on our agenda last year. Again, it's still <laughs> being discussed on whether or not this year is a good year for that. This involves um, trying to reserve our, our uh, um, trying to look at the right-of-way issues and some of the uh, land legal disputes. There were some landowners there and get that resolved. Uh, before you could look at building a trail, you want to make sure you have the land and DNR owns that. There's been some discrepancies there or some um, uh, disputes over that. We're asking DNR to resolve that so they could make a decision down the road if uh, we want to invest in our rail trail out that way. Um, Williamsport also uh, would like to see the Williamsport Tannery property cleaned up. However, right now that's still a little complicated issue as that's privately owned and whether or not we could get some state funds to assist with that. Um, we mentioned the Dolman Museum uh, under the watch list is having a, a page in the booklet uh, to highlight that item. If there's some specific requests there, uh, that, that is being, uh, there's a placeholder in the yellow items to hold for that. 
Uh, and then there's some items we have already removed this year. There were some questions about where is federal transportation funding going. Um, that that uh, information we got from our lobbyists and we, we circulated that to our members. Um, then there was also an issue with mental health uh, that we did not have any specific requests for this year. And telehealth reimbursement, trying to make sure that stays the same as in-office visits. But that's a federal issue versus a state issue. Um, the other two items in your package just had to do with some of the more recent uh, newer projects. Uh, we had some, we call them blue sheets, but uh, some draft blue sheets on the Boonesboro project as well as the Clara Barton Memorial. And then there is some key dates on your last page um, that Paul mentioned that um, we just want to make sure all the partners you know, continue to work with. We need to try to finalize our agenda by the uh, mid-October. We need to present that to our state delegation on November 9th. That is their uh, typical all-county meeting day where they meet with groups all day in Washington County. We have uh, them slated for a lunch meeting where we'll be able to go over the agenda for 2022, get them up to date on that. And then uh, we'll start working um, uh, with Eric and his team to help get the booklet uh, developed that we could submit to Annapolis. So. Forgive me if I went too quick on that, but if anyone has any questions, we're happy to answer them the best we could. Um, if you'll see the blue type in your, in your packet, those are some notes from the last meeting. This will actually be part of the minutes from the last meeting. We'll probably send out on Thursday, but I just left those in because I thought it might help you follow what uh, was discussed last week. Do you guys have any questions for them? So the ask is for the city to fund the five thousand dollars, the same yeah, level that, that yeah. we did last year. And, and just before they ask, we want to thank you for your past support. Sorry, <laughs> that's okay. No, no, <laughs> we appreciate you. You, know, but, you know, in all sincerity, we do want to thank the mayor and council for past support. You know, we've talked about this in years past. We have a great reputation in Hagerstown, Washington County, and Annapolis for working together, having one voice, having one list of requests. And again, we're going to use the money that we get from our partners to retain the service of the Manus Canning, the John Favaz, as the lead lobbyist. And so um, we made a request for other partners. I've not had a no yet. So the folks who were with us last year, as Jim mentioned, in addition to the town of Boonesboro, looks like we're all going to be on board. Um, and so we would again ask that this the mayor and council um, consider supporting us again in the coming year. And we have some good items again for an agenda. And we'll look forward to uh, working with our General Assembly and our partners here with the delegation. Sounds good. All right. Mm -hmm. yep. good. Thank yeah. you all very much. Yep. Don't hesitate to call if you have anything. Our next meeting is next Wednesday, the 13th. That'll be the last meeting we finalize things. So if you have any new items, just let us know. We'll get them out to the group and go from there. But thanks for your help so far. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yep. <sighs> All right, up next we have a proposal for placement of the helicopter at the Vietnam Monument on South Walnut Street. We have Jim Klein, the president of the Joint Veterans Council. Uh, with me is uh, Ron Motes, uh, commander of Bloomsburg American Post 10 Legion. For those that don't know, my name is Jim Klein, and I'm now the president of uh, the Joint Veterans Council uh, of Washington County. Uh, I want to thank you for putting this on the agenda. Uh, I believe you may have heard about our proposal for a helicopter before our actual request was formally presented to you. At this time, I would like to formally present our idea and ask that you all keep an open mind on. Uh, during this presentation that you listen to the proposal that we are about to submit. One of the most familiar images of the Vietnam War was the helicopter. It was used for troop transportation to deliver supplies for medical evacuation as well as many other th uses. I would bet that many of the men whose names are on the, the monument were airlifted from wherever and their bodies taken to the next stop before being sent home to their parents and their loved ones. We would like to place a full-size helicopter to the left of the current, current monument 
and back near the embankment coming up from the Arbor Trail, near the cottonwood trees currently located there. The helicopter would be mounted in the air so that no one has access to get up in uh, the helicopter. Uh, the inside will be completely empty, but the outside <coughs> will look like the helicopters we remember from the Vietnam War. It will be freshly painted. We do not seek to take away the, from the beauty of the Vietnam Monument as it now is or the purpose for which it was erected. We believe that the helicopter will enhance the current Vietnam Monument. This addition can be used as an educational tool for students of Washington County as well as others. We would, we would hope that having this unique addition to our monument will highlight the role that the helicopters had in the lives of the Vietnam veterans. This addition could also increase visitors to the monument in Hagerstown and could increase tourism in Washington County, which is already rich in military history. From Antietam in the Civil War to other veterans' monuments and memorials located throughout our, our county. Because we heard that there would may be opposition to the placement of the helicopter, we began to circulate a petition asking those who support this helicopter addition to, to sign uh, the, our petitions. I have approximately over 500 and some names uh, thus far. Uh, when circulating the petition, the number one question asked of us was why would anybody be opposed or in opposition, you know, to the helicopter at that site? It's a very good question, but one we have no answer for. So our response is always, I don't know. City Park is always evolving. We just celebrated 100 years since its inception. Look how far it has come since then. There's a locomotive train and museum at the end, one end of the park. There are softball fields, playgrounds, a band shell for concerts, and a museum of fine arts. We have the Hager House and our beautiful lake. There's an area in the park dedicated to our first responders. We have a piece of the World Trade Center in the park that will forever remind us of the fateful day in our country, 9-11, a day, a time, that we will never forget and that we should never forget. City Park has truly expanded. There's something there for just about everyone. And now we have the Vietnam War Veterans Monument. The area of the park where the monument stands was once a dumping ground where bricks, broken pieces of concrete, blocked large rocks and other debris were deposited in an attempt to build up and widen the land on the west side of South Walnut Street. When we were in the process of building the monument, we had to excavate five feet down just to reach solid ground. We had to, play, had to place crushed stone and compact that, then repeat that process several times in order to be able to have solid footing to place our foundations for the monument pieces as well as the concrete pad. We believe that the monument has made what was once a forgotten piece of ground and turned it into a beautiful site, a sacred site. I'm sorry, a sacred piece of land honoring those who died and honoring those who served. Uh, it's amazing to see the pictures of the monument that, that we dedicated on March 29th of 2019. And then to look at it today, uh, Every time we made improvements to the monument, it was, with, it was with the intention to make the monument site look better. We believe that the addition of the helicopter will continue the theme of the Vietnam monument and that it will be appreciated by many. It usually surprises people the amount of sweat and dedication I've put into this monument, especially when they learn that I didn't actually serve in Vietnam. I did, I did actually serve uh, my country in Korea and Germany. But I was one of those military personnel who was spit on, who was called names, and who was looked on and discussed when I returned back in the States from my tours of duty. Since the Joint, first, Joint Veterans Council first formed its committee for this project, I have been and I continue to remain dedicated to the monument and its upkeep. But it's not about me. I'm just a voice for those who can't no longer 
speak and for those who are forgotten. Closing, I respectfully request you to permit the Joint Veterans Council to place a helicopter at the Vietnam War <coughs> Veterans Monument on South Walnut Street. Again, I thank you for allowing us the time to come in, this opportunity to present our idea. And I, I know you, I uh, sent a packet in. I hope you, everybody had uh, received that packet. They do. Uh, it did, I got a couple of pictures that I'd circulate here uh, of the different aspects of it, what it looked like when we first dedicated that. Um, the improvements we've, we've actually made over at the site. You know. um, yeah, I apologize, just got those copies, so I didn't have enough for everybody to get this. Check them there. Uh, and Ron would like, uh, like to say a few words there. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, I'd like to thank the mayor and council for considering this uh, proposal. Uh, when I heard about the project that uh, Jim was proposing uh, at post 10, we uh, initiated uh, a sign-up sheet for people who wanted to sign the petition. And as a support, I submitted a letter to Jim, which he asked me to read today. Uh, to Hagerstown Mayor Emily Keller and the Hagerstown uh, City Council, Copper Michael Post 10, Boonesboro American Legion would like to add its support for the placement of a helicopter at the Vietnam War Memorial. Many of our post members served in Vietnam and are grateful for the role that the helicopter played in Vietnam. It was a welcome sight when it provided cover fire while they were under attack. It not only transported troops in and out of combat, it kept them supplied while in the field and was a lifesaver for many wounded by ensuring a timely transport for medical treatment. We at Post 10 Field is an appropriate addition to the existing memorial on South Walnut Street. Included with this letter are numerous signatures of Post 10 members and friends in support of the helicopter placement at the memorial. Ron Moats, Commander. Thank you. At this time, if there's any questions, I can... Could I speak? That's... Uh, our the Joint Veterans past president that yes. Kim brought. Yes, sir. Here, he can sit here. That's okay. Can I sit over there? Oh, oh you could sit beside me. <laughs> I don't know. I care how I smell. I just get out of the field. <laughs> My name is uh, Richard Hembrock. I'm a former Army chaplain for the uh, Army and uh, served in Vietnam at the beginning with the 1st Air Cav, which is all helicopters. And uh, I also served again at the closing of the war, again under the Department of Defense, and I was down at headquarters in Saigon with a uh, uh, former general there. Anyway, uh, I served as a chaplain to the intelligence group throughout Vietnam at that time, and uh, me and another chaplain that worked, we worked together uh, from one end of Vietnam to another. There was no way that we could work without the Huey helicopter, both at the beginning and at the end. At first, it was a, a, a whole new type of concept of military work and, uh, and success, and it was. Uh, it does, on the first place I was stationed with the 1st Air Cav was in Anke, which is right off the South China Sea, but we were back into a little village called Anke. And if you would have seen that base, it was a line of helicopters a mile long and over 12 different rows of helicopters. And I was the chaplain to both the crewmen and the pilots. And I flew with them. I have, the, they did it, not me, but they gave me three air medals because that's all I, all I used was helicopters. And one guy suggested uh, that I, I applied for those. And he did it for me, I did not do it. Anyway, I flew way over 400 hours of, in the air with all Hueys in most cases. I was a chaplain. When the wounded came in, they came in on Huey helicopters. When the dead came in, they came in those same helicopters. And the uh, Catholic chaplain and I would minister to those men. The only time we saw a fixed wing was when we arrived and when we left. Now, I don't know whether all of you 
and here has ever served in Vietnam. But the taxi of Vietnam was the helicopter, the Huey helicopter. And uh, uh, that, to me, when you walk into the uh, place of honor that we've built, we've built here for those who have given their lives and for all Vietnam veterans, that they will understand that image of that helicopter. Uh, and uh, it would be a great addition uh, to the town of Hagerstown to have that. Um, I can't tell you how, how much I, I still wake up whenever I hear a helicopter go over. And the first thing I think about over my house, first thing I think about is, is Vietnam. And I remember when I arrived, I was taken to my, my post in a Huey helicopter. When I left, I was taken out of the field and everything was a field there. And, uh, and then flown to go home. Uh, and most every soldier experienced this. And I've seen, I've seen them carry out the dead. I've been there with them when the dead have arrived. I've triaged the, the living and the dead with uh, the uh, uh, people that do that personnel. So I'm, I'm saying that that image will strike the heart of, of every parent who's lost uh, uh, and any siblings that go into that monument, that will, they'll remember the pictures that were sent home. And in, there, in every one of those pictures, they had a Huey copter somewhere, Huey helicopter, because they were riding them. I rode them with them. That's, and I really feel it would be very apropos as long as it doesn't cost the park service anything, we'll raise the money. I think it would be a very historical thing. This is, a, this is to bring remembrances. That's what monuments are for, to remember and to hold in our hearts what sacrifices were made and how they were made possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your service. <coughs> Any other questions? So, I mean, I, I don't know if this is a question uh, as much as a statement, but, I, you know, obviously in our deliberations for these types of things, and I know that you say that you have received uh, awareness that folks have concerns, um, mm -hmm. I think are, are, some are probably opposed. You know, most of those folks are, are probably folks that live in the immediate area. And so I think for us at this table, you know, you have folks that are, you know, in support. We hear from folks that, that you know, that live in the area that are opposed. Uh, and I think opposed in part because of the unknowns associated with the, uh, the visual uh, impact uh, in that small area. Um, and so I think for us, we have to weigh that. And for me, so I went there yesterday and, you know, uh, looked around. I, and the, so, so the visual that you provided clearly is not a visual that is presented at a scale that is realistic. Proportional. Yeah. I, I mean, it's not—it's not realistic at all when you look at the dimensions and and you're, you're talking about a structure that that's you know 60, 60 feet long, 15 feet high, and 15 feet 57, wide. 57 so, feet long. So with the with the right so rotor, right, 50 to 60 feet long. Yeah. Um, the entire uh, memorial space. You know what I mean? You're talking about, uh, um, and and for me, I think that the only thing I could compare it to <clears throat> is when you're going up 81, and you get, I guess, towards Letterkenny, and you see some of the apparatus the Army War College. Um, on on the left side. But you see that from I-81, and you see that from probably two or three hundred feet away, probably even more than that, from I-81 at a rate of travel of about 70 miles an hour, right? You go, a little, you go a little further up and you see the huge uh, um, <coughs> tractor and trailer that's up, up on the two support yeah. posts at right. the, the truck mark. Is the only the other thing I can think of, of that size and magnitude being held up on pedestals that I would have a firsthand visual uh, knowledge of. Mm -hmm. uh, because that, that tractor and trailer is probably 73, 75 feet long. Right. Um, it's probably about 14 feet high, 14 feet wide. So to me, that is probably the most comparable visual. But again, you see that tractor and trailer, which still looks large and odd and, and, and imposing,
from a distance of about four or 500 feet from the highway. And so I try and bring that visual perspective to a street that you travel 25 miles an hour on, that's 20 feet wide, that you have then this apparatus that is just off of the sidewalk, if you will. And I realize you're saying it'll be up in the air and a little bit back, but if you go there, and I was just there yesterday, you don't have but maybe, you know, 70, 80 feet of space till you get to the embankment, right? Yeah, we're talking about, Chris. So okay, I want to make sure where, Yeah. Uh, when you're in that area. The, the Photoshop picture that we put in the packet there, you know, we also included that it was, it, it's not proportionate for that actual picture. I mean, it's hard to, to actually place that where we wanted it. It would be back on that bank by the cottonwood trees to the left. On the other side of the creek, or on no, the Walnut Street side? Now, the now that there's been an arbor trail put in there, you know, there's been an arbor trail put down the back of that bank on this side of the creek. We're talking on the bank by the cottonwood trees, back as far on that bank as we can. What, I know what you're saying as far as up at the War College, the one you see from 81 and your truck thing. When you went by there, is there trees or anything around them? Well, there's trees on the back side of those. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of cover, I mean, to conceal most of that helicopter. The picture that I, I had screenshot there, I've, I've showed 100 people that picture. And you know what? 99 of them didn't even recognize that chopper sitting back in the corner. They are more focused on coming through the archway, looking at the main part of that monument, you know. Well, so I just want to make sure I understand because when I measured that yesterday, this this light. Yeah, see, that's, that's. So the light's about three feet apart, right? right? Yeah. Well, this helicopter you have photoshopped into here looks like it's three feet long. I mean, if I'm looking at these two yeah, visually. Yeah, well, it's kind of hard to do, you know, in Photoshop to put that back I get in that. perspective. But you're asking me as part of this body to approve something that is of a permanent nature, that is of a size magnitude, that I don't have a readily available comprehension of what that's going to look like once it's in place, when it's up on pillars. And for me, I have that concern. So somebody would have to physically go out there, put something up of that size magnitude as a sample. I don't care whether it's a sheet of paper or something, and show me what that's going to look like visually in perpetuity, number one. And number two, if you're talking about being back beyond the creek uh, at no, all. No, not, it would still be on I, this side of the creek. I have concern as we creep toward the Hager House because I think they're two very different things. Um, and, and so I'm trying to make sure that I respect uh, those uh, separations uh, for uh, that area, you know, that, that has a, a multitude of things. Yeah. Does that make sense? So I'm at the Hager house, you know, and it's looking like a house that's from, you know, 1750, and I look over and I, I see a helicopter that's 60 feet long. That's, I, I just want to make sure for me, like, I, I don't have any huge inclination to to combine those things any more than I have an inclination to have an apparatus that is overly imposing to the streetscape um, and and the, duct, the juxtaposition with the uh, uh, with the monument here. So those are my two concerns. Okay, I mean I can take take that in, into consideration. I mean, but the the way we propose it would be back there far enough that you you know. It would be on this side of the creek. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't go over the footbridge, yeah. You know, and it would be back. You, right now, you got two cottonwood trees back there. Yeah, one's kind Huge. of bent up. One's facing the city park, leaning. There actually was right. three. There's one buried back there on that bank. You know. Um, I think you know the what the placement of it up on the pylons. You know, 25, 30 feet in the air. You know. You're only going to see probably the front part of it. Yeah, yeah I don't know. I, I, and I mean, I it's only six that. foot wide. Uh, the The chopper itself is only six foot wide. It, it's actually eight feet out to the rails. Yeah. You know.
Do you guys have any any questions? Any questions? What's your time frame? Well, my, my, uh, I was told not to even uh, go looking for one. You know, back in May when I first asked to, to be put on the agenda to, to uh, present a proposal. But then in August, you know, there's a letter that come out to the mayor and council, two-page letter complaining about everything, you know. And when they brought up about the helicopter, to me, how'd that happen? You know? Yeah, I didn't know about it until I read them. Like, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's because I also asked to have a couple other things done, mm -hmm. you know, a handicapped spot and a curb cut, you know. But... You know, time time frame. I mean, it's 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 a matter of, you know, we're going to have to raise money. It's not going to cost the city, you know, one dime. You know, I mean, it, the city hasn't, other than giving us that piece of, of sacred ground, is what we call it. You know, it was a dump zone before, and and that part of the park really, you know. Okay. Let me I'll, see. I was just half afraid to walk down through there. What I would suggest. I'm sure that you have access or somebody will come forward at some point in time after this meeting and be able to help you uh, to do a drawing yeah, that's more the more, size yeah. of what it, it's, it's going to finally look like in that area, okay? Yeah. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen a, there was out there, there was a picture of a UH-1 right over top of our pad you know, and I would tell you right now, there's no way in heck we would ever think about putting a helicopter right there right. or even right behind it because right. we don't want to take away from what from what's there, we right. put there. Right. And in our mind, it's one of the best monuments in the country. Yeah. Oh, I think you so. know, bar none. I'm not, you know, patting myself on the back or, or, or the committee or anything. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, we designed it, we, we raised the money, we did everything. We came to the city, and if they didn't want it there, they wouldn't have gave us that piece of property back in back when I was here. You know, asking for that. You know. Maybe maybe you could put that together and be able to send it in so we could get a better understanding. And maybe yeah, I mean it's hard. It's hard to Photoshop it is. because it is. I, that is like Kristen said. That is that when you look at the light pole and you look at the, the choppers. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's definitely sure, sure. too big. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But I think being tucked back in there, you know, and of course right. now with the with that arbor trail, you know, that that may, you know, it may tend to to uh, throw it all out of kilter. Yeah. You know. And then what's to say that right now there's a big uh, wooded break to the right of us? Instead of going to the left side, we could possibly, you know, put it on the right side. Yeah, I just think it'd be a, 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 an exceptional piece of history to go along with, with that yeah. beautiful monument. Yeah. yeah. It, it is definitely a beautiful monument, for sure. And I, you know, as I discussed with you on the phone, I think mm -hmm. it is by far the most beautiful monument in the city, but I don't believe that a 60-foot helicopter is adding value to that in a city park. I mean, the point of the, the park is to be an oasis away from city life. I think that's what they originally said when they built it. And I, I just think the character of a entire helicopter doesn't match with the landscape that is currently there or the rest of the park at all. Hmm. I agree, but um, a different location, in my opinion, would be more suitable, but I do respect the thought process behind having a helicopter, because I think that is important history, but not necessarily at the city park. Where would you suggest? I mean, Halfway Park has an all war uh -huh. memorial that's very large. Uh, I can tell you right now that I, I'm not going to go out, out on a limb to get a UH-1 to place anywhere in this county or state other than over there you know i'm not going to dedicate you know I, I put put my self out there as as 
volunteering and, and being ex-Army, they always tell you, you don't volunteer for nothing. But I, I volunteered to, to chair a committee to put what is sitting over there right now at the park. And I know when you, you and I discussed on the phone and you said it didn't meet the theme of the park. Well, to me, what was it, what is, or what was and what is the theme of that part of City Park? I think you have Hegger House down, way, way down, and then now with the Arbor Trail, you know, you have a cultural trail downtown that wraps all the way around, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I think residents get to decide that. I mean, I, and I, I'll use this example. I wasn't in favor of the, the, the permanent benches that we installed in front of the amphitheater. I thought it took away from the historical context. But I didn't win that, that, that debate. All I'm saying is I think that everybody sort of gets to decide that. And some you, some you, you know, win, win, win that debate on and some you lose. And, and that, that, that's how it uh, occurs. Um, are you saying that the neighborhood should have the input no, 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 no. for it? What I'm saying is I think that those things get weighed in the context, they get weighed over time, and everybody sort of has an interpretation of what the facets of that park um, are intended to be. Yeah, you know, if you talk to the Mansion House folks, it's, it, it's, it's, it's an art park for the Mansion House of the owner that lived there. If you talk to the folks that wanted the, the, the lake dredged, it, it was, you know, to dredge the lake for, for that or you know, or the people with the, the seed pods. All I'm saying is, is, is I think that that's not up to any one specific entity, and certainly not for any one specific purpose at any one specific part of the land of the park. Like as opposed to uh, Well, you got yeah, you got trains and yeah. I mean, do me if I, I'll I'll do that. And I'll yeah, yeah, try and then that. let us have a better visual maybe it can sway some opinion well we can also go out there with rodney and eric and mm -hmm. get a better visual of what it will look like yeah. yeah because i mean and i'll use this example when you say 25 to 30 feet and i was out there yesterday i'm thinking 30 feet if you go over to to what i'll call the grassy area back toward the those cottonwoods you know if you're tall if you start at 30 feet let's say from that from that plateau that's different than if you go down the bank 12 feet and start at 30 feet at that plateau. To me, that is a very different context, which is why I said at the beginning of this conversation, somebody would just about have to go out there and hold up. And we did this uh, at South County when they wanted to know what the tower looked like, right? Somebody's actually got to go out there, uh, just like we did there, we held the balloon up in South County and said, here's the height of the tower, you know, you can expect to see. Somebody would almost have to do that for me to visualize what a 60 foot long you know, 15 foot tall piece of equipment up in the air is going to look like in our city park. That, I mean, that, that's as bottom line as I can be about that. I, agree. Well, I mean, we would be going down the bank. It wouldn't be on the top of the bank. I hear you. And, and, and you know, right now you got 40 invasive, people, 40 invasive species of weeds that are growing all down that whole park. To me, it's no different than the North High. take over the whole park. To me, it's no different than the North High tower that was a sign conversation. Uh, we're, we're, before I say yes to it, somebody's got to show me what that, that looks like. Yeah. All right. Well, we can make that happen. I hope you will. Yeah. Oh, well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Up next, we have the pump station number 33, Nancy and Kellen. Um, Kellen and I are here this evening just to briefly talk about um, Pump Station 33, which uh, replaces, which will ultimately replace Pump Station 9. Um, for a while now, we uh, receive uh, fairly 
consistent um, requests associated with economic development and the capacity in this pump station and what needs to be done and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, we've reached, it's, it's been in our CIP for a while and we've reached the point where we need to really move <coughs> forward with um, this pump station. And um, it'll, you know, to address both um, the aging infrastructure as well as um, growth that has occurred in the system since the pump station was built and uh, growth that is hoping to occur um, as we move forward. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Kellen and he can um, kind of go down, go through the details uh, of what's, what's needed. <coughs> well, as Nancy said, pump station nine is an aging pump station that consists of a buried steel structure that is uh, showing signs of wear and tear. Electrical components are becoming obsolete, making finding replacement parts very difficult. Um, this pump station has a very limited ability for increasing capacity due to the pump station access and available space within the pump station itself. Usable space around the pump station is questionable as well. In addition to the structural and capacity limitations of pump station nine, the physical location is not ideal for, for providing gravity sewer service to the surrounding undeveloped land. To alleviate these issues, this concept plan that you have was prepared to show, to show uh, pump station 33 along Heb Road, roughly 2,500 feet west of the existing pump station. This location was selected to maximize gravity sewer service potential and limit the need for additional pumping of the wastewater. Uh, staff and the city attorney met with the landowner and their legal counsel regarding this location of the pump station. Each party was agreeable with the location as this location meets the desires of the property owner uh, to locate the pump station within the floodplain. Uh, as long as uh, Mayor Council is agreeable to this location, one of the next steps in the project is to finalize the subdivision plat for the pump station site. In the event, uh, additionally, in the event R. Paul Smith Boulevard gets extended in the future, the pump station location shouldn't be affected. Uh, pump station 33 will be designed to include capacity of the sewer service area upstream of the pump station, as well with the ability for future expansion in mind. With regard to the existing capacity of Pump Station 9, our ability to serve projects on the horizon within the service area would be questionable without relocation of the existing pump station. Pump Station 33 will take care of this concern. In all, this project will include the extension of the gravity sewer, will include an extension of the gravity sewer system, the pump station, and associated force main. The estimated cost for this project is expected to fall within the range of 3.0 to $3.4 million, which includes a 20% contingency on construction, engineering permitting, and other project soft costs. Uh, funding options for this project include the ARPA money, as well as MDE funding. Benefit fees from projects on the horizon could also be used to fund portions of this project. So I guess what we're asking for is to uh, the approval to move forward with the design and bidding portions of this project. So what, is, what does nine do right now? Service area? No, directional mm -hmm. flow. Right now, where does it go? Just straight up the dual highway? Up the dual highway to the, like, the, the I guess it would be the... little star at the top of this yep. um, map, yep. right? Upper right corner, yeah. So it, so it pumps it there? Yep. And you're saying that that, that pump station is uh, 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 reaching its, its useful life cycle, right? Mm, yes. So you're going to abandon that pump station. Yep. It'll gravity flow to nine, and then it'll gravity flow around... The TOFO, um, I'm assuming green's in, yellow's out, right? So yellow's the force main back yellow's, out? Yes. And I'm, I'm just, so I'm assuming the reason you're not using the roadbed is because of topography issues? Correct. Because, I mean, you're just, you're just sending that thing through the woods. 
but the road's too too hilly to it, get. Correct. So so there would be no benefit to getting it to nine and having nine send it in the roadbed to new thirty three. I guess that's my curiosity. No, we would have to potentially upgrade nine and build a new pump station. I think the most cost effective option would be to abandon nine and build thirty three. So it's cheaper to take it out here yeah. than it is to keep the station and take it straight, right? Correct. And the beneficiaries of the new green will be all of this undeveloped land. All this undeveloped land, yes, and there's a section across the right. highway yep and they're going to pay for that through then well we i mean is this just connection charge payment like to reimburse or well, what we are they paying like a like you know no it'd just be the benefit the benefit allocation fees is we, we, we would we would be looking at those part of um pump station nine we've done a fair amount of lining work but pump station nine is at capacity so um, you know, the benefit fees essentially would cover, um, you know, much of the cost for the additional capacity associated with the new customers coming on. So you're saying they're going to cover the cost of this project? So the, the portion of the project associated with growth, the portion of the project associated with... Um, Carrying the, current capacity. Current, current capacity, I got you. no. ARPA funding. ARPA, um, or, and MDA. Potential infrastructure money. Yeah. We'll look, you know, we'll use the benefit fees, our, which is our restricted cash. Do you have an estimate for this? Yeah. I'm yeah. Like yeah. On page two of the um, memo, oh, uh, Kellen put together an estimate that has a 20% contingency built into it. Okay. It also assumes a 20% um, engineering. I was at Three million. So I yeah. figure you're about there, right? Um, so. You know, like, like Kellen said, our ask this evening is to go ahead and be able to move forward with the design and bidding. And I think it's important to mention, too, that, um, you know, as this land develops, it also, because it's the customers will be inside municipal limits, it will also generate um, tax revenue for property tax revenue for the city. Um, so there's, you know, not only is it an infrastructure improvement, for um, the utilities department, but it also is, um, a, you know, w will result in benefits to uh, the general fund as well. Will you be taking anybody off septic out in this area? Um, we would love to be able to, to do that, um, and that's a conversation that um, we've had internally, staff has, where there are septic systems, um, septic tanks inside city limits. Um, to date, the city has not, if you will, forced these customers <coughs> to connect to the sewer system. Um, it's certainly in, we certainly have the authority to do so in city code. I'm just saying you get like a third or a fourth of a credit, a third or a fourth of a credit, mm -hmm. 0.3 or 0.4 of an acre credit yeah. per one that you take off mm -hmm. towards MS4. Yes. Right? And if, it, like I said, if the city would um, want to move forward with that, we, you know, that's a discussion that we could certainly have. It's certainly allowed in code. Um, so. It stinks that we can't go down to have a road. I, I don't know. I'll like, keep utilities and road beds to the degree yeah, possible. That but. is extremely, you're right, extremely mm -hmm. yeah. construction costs. Oh, yeah. It, right. It's very, very deep. Yes. Yeah. You know, I've been by when when nine's been on like the pump arounds where you've had the, the pipe laying on the ground. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I clearly understand. Yeah, it's pretty ugly. Yeah. Or it can be pretty ugly. Yeah. You guys good with them moving forward? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. As long as it don't smell like that one down Virginia oh, Avenue, God. the county build. Um, <laughs> I'm happy. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone's favorite subject. <laughs> Trick, Trick or treat. Or treat. Trick or treat. <laughs> the most controversial topic we deal with all <laughs> Uh, just just wanted to give everyone a heads up. Um, the Mummers Parade, as far as we know, is still on for Saturday, October 30th. 
So October 31st um, is available uh, for trick or treat. I just want to make sure everyone understands uh, as it's written here in a memo. Uh, it is suggested to families trick or treat this year on Sunday, October 31st from 6 to 8 p.m. in order to give your friends, motors, and police an idea of when to expect pedestrians and visitors at the door. Participation and scheduling is entirely up to each family. Since trick-or-treat will not be scheduled by the city, the city would not reschedule or suggest a rain date in the event of inclement weather or because of any health crisis. Moreover, it's perfectly acceptable for folks to opt out and not participate. You do what's best for, the, for your family. Yeah. For those that weren't here last year, this came about uh, actually two years ago uh, when uh, we had a hurricane blowing through and uh, we were inundated with calls about what were we going to do about trick-or-treat. And you canceled it. And I canceled it. Um, Listen, you didn't oh. cancel something that isn't that a city isn't event. That isn't a city event. <laughs> it's that but easy. Did. Right. It's a worldwide <laughs> but you did it anyway. But I, yeah. So that's why we came out. And then COVID, of course, put, uh, put the wrench into things. So this year, October 31st, the city will be aware that there will be folks trick-or-treating. And we'll be on the lookout for, uh, you know, making sure folks are, are safe and all. But if it rains, snows, sleets, or hails, uh, the city will not be making any determination about whether you're going to continue to trick-or-treat. You do what is best for you. And you can turn your light on or you can turn your light off at your house. There you go. Okay. That's all I'm saying. Thank you, Mayor. City Administrator comments. All right. Just a couple things. Uh, Saturday is Fall Fest at Farmer's Market, 9 to 11. Always a nice event uh, over on the market lot. And Harvest Hoedown and the last community the last community yard sale is this Saturday at Fairgrounds Park, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. The location is moved. Normally, it's where um, it's where the basketball courts are, but since the skate park is being built there, everything is moving over to the soccer field side. So don't think it's not happening when you don't see it in the normal place. Go across the park, and you will find it over there. And again, it's a nice event. And the first 1,000 kids to Harvest Hoedown get a free pumpkin. Oh, nice. So nice. there you go. That is it for me. Nice. All right. Bob? Tiara? Nothing tonight. Kristen? I don't have anything. Takesha? I just want to say over the weekend, the community cleanup, it was awesome to ride down through a town and see all the firefighters out uh, picking up trash. And then also cleaning up Avalon with you. It was pretty awesome, too. Found yes. some pretty interesting finds. And the Unity Walk. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, pretty interesting. And the Unity Walk was also amazing. So thank you, Troy Grandy, for your consistency with that. So. Yes. I also just wanted to thank everyone who participated in the community cleanup. I got several pictures and texts and tags online. So that was great. Also, that morning, um, r and Recovery sponsored a recovery softball tournament at our fairgrounds park, and it was really awesome. We had a first responder team come from Berkeley County and some other teams of people that were in recovery, so they got to play each other and show a different side of each other. So um, thank them for putting that on. Um, also, congratulations to Officer Spencer Nye. I was able to attend the police graduation on a Friday evening, he'll be joining HPD once he turns 21. He's almost there, so <laughs> congratulations to him. And I just wanted to thank you guys, the council, for my proclamation last night. I was awarded a Woman of the Year from the Business and Professional Women and council members here. And Takesha came out, and I really appreciated, one, not having to read the proclamation for once, mm -hmm. but also the recognition from you guys, so I, I genuinely appreciate it. Congratulations. Thank you. And with that, we're adjourned. Everyone have a good week. Thank you.
Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, the difficult thing is, Hello and welcome to Council Wrap. I'm Wes Decker, uh, pleased to be joined by Fire Marshal Dale Fishak and uh, Fire Chief Steve Lohr. Thanks for being here, guys. I know this is kind of a, a, a bittersweet time in a way with Fire Prevent, uh, Prevention Month uh, upon us. Um, and, and Chief, you talked about it a little bit and I'd like you to hit on it a little bit more. Just the history of Fire Prevention Month because I find that pretty fascinating that we're going all the way back to the 19th century to find the roots of this. A absolutely. Um, Fire Prevention Month, uh, as you said, Wes, has its roots from a October 1871 fire in the city of Chicago. And historians have it that, um, uh, you know, a cow kicked over a lantern uh, at the uh, uh, O'Leary's, uh, house that started a fire that ravaged the city of Chicago, its entire business district, and resulted in, uh, I think, 17 square miles of loss and over 100 deaths. Not as well known, on the same day, the exact same day, uh, in a small town in Wisconsin, uh, the city of Peshtigo, Wisconsin, lost their city town and that resulted in over 1,000 deaths wow. the same day. Dale, clearly, I mean, those are devastating events. And in today's world, fortunately, we really, really don't see things like that on a large scale. But losing any life to fire obviously is something that, you know, on a daily basis, you're attempting to prevent. So what should people pay attention to as we open up Fire Prevention Month and really call their attention to preventing fires, especially in the home? So every year they come out with a theme for Fire Prevention Week. We've had uh, the uh, leave your cooking and don't leave your cooking unattended uh, themes. This year's theme, of course, is learn the sound of the smoke detector. So every day you should be practicing fire safety and remembering all the messages that we've put out. But probably the two main important things that people can take from um, any message in protecting themselves at home is having a working smoke detector on every level of their home, having them in the sleeping areas. Make sure they're in working order. That means testing them. Uh, I recommend they test them weekly to make sure that they work. Make sure that if they're battery-operated smoke detectors, that they leave the batteries in. They don't take them out and use them in other devices. We find that is a common theme as we go throughout the city. The batteries are removed either because they're chirping because the battery became dead and mm -hmm. they recognize that and don't replace it, or they use them in another device in their home. <clears throat> so the best thing it can do is have that working smoke detector. And when it sounds, they need to exit the building and get out to, to a meeting place, uh, practice their fire safety drill and use it in that event of an emergency, and call 911 from outside the house. Uh, they, um, with that, if they have a working smoke detector and their home fire escape plan, uh, we've had many successful um, outcomes in the city. Combine that with sprinklers in the home, and there has not been a fire death related to a fully sprinklered home with working smoke alarms. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, but uh, it tells you exactly what you need to do to prevent that from happening clearly. But just, let, let me follow up on the, on, on the smoke detectors because obviously technology has come a long way over the years as it relates to smoke detectors. So what, what are the specs on smoke detectors these days, the ones that are the ones that people should have installed in their homes? So at a minimum, they should have a smoke detector that's 
um, not any older than 10 years. It should have a 10-year uh, lithium battery in it, and um, they should, again, test it, mm -hmm. look at the date regularly to make sure that they're within those guidelines. If you're building today, we require you to have an electrical smoke detector with a battery backup but not all the homes are required to have that. At minimum, they need to have the battery-operated smoke detector with a sealed 10-year uh, battery. And, and Chief, as, uh, as you and Dale talked about when you received the proclamation earlier, there's really no excuse for anyone in the city of Hagerstown not to have one in their home because all they need to do if they don't have one is call Hagerstown Fire Department. That, that's absolutely true. Uh, so long before I arrived as the city's fire chief, the uh, department had a program in place uh, to install smoke detectors, inspect smoke detectors, and provide batteries for people who were not resourced to have them. It is the first line of defense against surviving a fire, particularly at night when you're asleep. Uh, and uh, we've had great community partners, including uh, Lowe's, Home Depot, and the American Red Cross. Uh, we, we budget every year for uh, some smoke detectors. We uh, also uh, provide uh, folks who are hearing impaired uh, a special design smoke detector so that uh, they can feel comfortable in their own home as well. Has that initiative uh, had to be altered at all because of the pandemic? Uh, because I, and just personally, I know that I've had HFD firefighters knock on my door uh, over the years and say, hey, do you need a smoke detector or whatever? That, that hasn't happened for me personally, but it doesn't mean that you haven't been out. I mean, Dale referenced that, you know, you have been doing this, that the program remains in place, but I'm just wondering, you know, if, if it's, uh, you know, been altered in any way. I, I don't think I would, uh, it would be fair to say it's been altered. Uh, what we did at the peak of the pandemic last year was, uh, stop for a short period of time of okay. going out and knocking on doors sure with the understanding that if people uh we don't want anybody to go to bed at night without a working smoke detector right it, it's just that simple and uh so we wanted to be respectful of the citizens needs to isolate and um uh, not be exposed the uh, same way their employees uh but we essentially divide the city into thirds and we try to get to all parts of the city every third year by going out typically in the evening mm -hmm. in yep. uniform you'll see rigs on the street <laughs> so it's not somebody selling um, something they're not supposed to whatever we don't want you to be afraid you look out uh, your people in your door and you see a firefighter in uniform uh, with a smoke detector kit they're there to help the citizenry not try to sell them right. something inappropriate or whatever. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, Dale, what do you feel is is the most difficult uh, thing in, in getting uh, these what are really simple messages across to people? Because you know, one of the things for me is I, I hear kind of the, the the same language used all the time, and at some point, I think as human nature, we, we kind of tune that out a little bit because it's like I've heard this message before. But as we get into fire prevention month and this is really at the fore uh you know what kind of efforts do you put forth to make sure that that, that people once again tune into this message and adhere to it well i'll go back to the first part of your question i think everybody believes it won't happen to them yeah that's the that, yeah and, and that's a false sense of security yes so they they believe it won't happen to them it always happens to the neighbor always happens yeah. to somebody else um so what we do is go out and make those rounds to make sure that your smoke detectors work. Uh, we come out with really good press releases after we have a fire, unfortunately, and we try to drive home uh, the message to remind everybody that it can happen to you. Um, this week we're, we're pushing our message, uh, which is the national message of learning the sounds uh, because there are some confusing sounds out there now that they have carbon monoxide detectors as well. But both the smoke detector sounding and the carbon monoxide detector sounding are both emergencies. You need to react yeah. and exit your building and call 911. And then the other thing is uh, I think 
we all live a very busy lifestyle, so when that battery starts chirping, <laughs> it becomes very easy yeah. to be annoyed by it and uh -huh. taking it out, yep. and then you forget about it, oh, I'll get it the next time I go to the store, um, but you can't be without that protection. Yep. You should make sure that you, if you take it out, you replace it, or I'd rather you la leave it chirp for a day and it be annoying and remind you to go to the store the next morning. <laughs> Uh, or to go immediately yeah. than to take it out and go unprotected. And it is truly annoying. <laughs> There's no question about that. And it's supposed to be. Chief, Chief let's, let's end on, uh, on this note, kind of, uh, you know, turning a, a negative that, that, that Dale sort of alluded to into a positive. When we have those uh, fires in, in, in our community, and then you go out to the neighborhood afterwards and you talk to the neighbors out there, you find it is such a community and everybody wants to come together. Uh, can you talk about a little of the positives that have come out of some of those things? And, and even though it, it's been such a great negative that, that has impacted the community, there is that positive that comes out of it. Well, uh, that's exactly true, Wes. What I would say is that if somebody truly endures and suffers a life-changing fire, it's among the worst days of their lives. And in some cases, Regrettably, they're not survivable. Right. When a community experiences that, it's their neighbors, friends, sometimes relatives, et cetera. Uh, we've had three fire deaths this year in the city of Hagerstown, in spite of our prevention efforts. So as you mentioned, when we have those kind of fires, room and contents are greater. Uh, the same shift that fought the fire goes out the next shift, typically three days later and knocks on doors probably with a two or three block radius and say, hey, are you aware we had a uh, significant fire down the street and uh, we want you to do everything you can to prevent it? Can we help? Can we inspect your smoke detector? So on and so forth. The one thing that I think I've experienced in my career uh, that just seems to be a common theme is, and, and Dale's exactly right, most people believe it's not going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. They, they think their car is going to get broken into. They think they may get robbed, but a fire uh, is not going to happen. But when it does, the common theme I hear is how fast that fire developed and how little time they had to react. And that's part of our message as well is get out away from the fire, call 911, and get the help coming. And uh, that's why we're here, and that's what we'll do. What's the ble uh, best place or, or, or a resource for people to go to learn more, especially as, uh, you know, we usher in this Fire Prevention Month? Well, with social media, you can Google search just about anything, home fire safety, okay. fire prevention. Um, you know, cooking fires still remain a, uh, a very common cause of fires. Uh, we tell everybody, keep a lid uh, either the same size or bigger than the pan you're cooking with, and take the oxygen away from that yeah. fire if it ignites. Uh, but Dale's advice is solid and has been solid since uh, fire was invented by the cavemen. <laughs> get away from the fire and go get help. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, thank you, Dale. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Appreciate Thanks your for time. having us. Yeah, appreciate you guys and everything you do, as a matter of fact. Uh, that'll do it. That is a wrap for this week's uh, Council Wrap. We'll see you next time on uh, the city's uh, cable channel, Hub City Now, and on the city's uh, social media platforms. Till then, so long.